Richard is one. I know Kim Waring is one. I know Chris Malik is one. Jackie. Is Jackie is not here. Okay. This is the first time that we've uh, <coughs> something like this uh, with the option of two different times of the day. Um, so as you're filling out the evaluation forms at the end tonight, that might be something useful to comment upon. We had a very good crowd here this morning at 10, uh, slightly larger than this one. So uh, it, it works out better for some to have it in the daytime and some in the evening, and that's certainly fine with me. So uh, please feel free to comment on that. Welcome, especially if you are a guest here with us. I see some familiar faces, some who might, I believe, are visitors. The topic is a really interesting one, I thought. Um, and it was, as I said this morning, it was really easy to pick this topic three months ago when I didn't have to think about it. <laughs> and then the more I got into it, the more overwhelming it started to be. And at this morning's session, and we will not go to 9 o'clock, by the way, this morning's session was a lot of conversation about the nature of God and holy mystery, because that's quickly where this discussion leads, as I hope to demonstrate to you. So, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? Uh, and to start off tonight, and by the way, conversation is always welcome here, including in the midst of anything I say. Um, and if you're having trouble hearing me, just wave. Um, I can always put that a little bit closer. My, my training in theology, my graduate training, is in systematic theology, which has to do a lot with the mystery of God and the mystery of Jesus and the mystery of the church. And as I told the folks this morning, if you leave here tonight with your head spinning and feeling as though you know less than when you started, <laughs> uh, you probably understood it pretty well. <laughs> that is exactly what this kind of study tends to produce. We're we're doing the audacious task of trying to comment about God and God's nature and how God works in the world. Uh, who in the world would dare to do that except people like me? So uh, let's be appropriately humble about that. But to start off, I would like to simply read to you two different biblical narratives concerning the beginnings of Jesus. The first from the so-called prologue of the Gospel of John and the second from a familiar nativity story from the Gospel of Matthew, both of which I'm sure will be very familiar to you. But I'd like you to note the vast difference between these two accounts. This is the beginning of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the light was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Skipping a few verses. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son full of grace and truth. You may recognize that as the gospel during the day on the festival of Christmas every year. Now let's go to Matthew. Again, the first chapter. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. 
He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. So, going back to the title of this evening's reflection, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? I hope you can see the incredible difference that these two Gospels have as an answer to that question. For the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Where was Jesus in the Old Testament? He was everywhere. He was way before the Old Testament. He is from the beginning of time. For as long as there's been God, there's been God's Word has become, now become flesh. What about Matthew? Where was Jesus in the Old Testament? He didn't exist. He was born in Bethlehem about 2,000 years ago, right on schedule, according to God's plan and dreams of Joseph and plans of Mary to be a virgin mother. Which one is right? Welcome to the overwhelming nature of this conversation. These two Gospels are telling us something very different about the nature of the Incarnation, the, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they're trying to point out two different things, and this is where we quickly leap into the mystery of God. Jesus, the baby, is a human being, like you and me. As such, he has a birthday, roughly 4 BC. He has a place of birth in Bethlehem. And his history can be charted more or less through the Gospels. The Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, does not have a birthday. He is with God from the beginning. He is the Word, capital W. And eventually, at some point in history, roughly 4 BC, he becomes flesh and lives among us. I hope you see already there is a difference here between baby Jesus and the Word of God. And yet, in our Catholic Christian tradition, those two are the same people, the same person. How can one say that about the same person? To do this, we have to go back into the mystery of God. And as I noted this morning, one of the problems in doing that is that we contemporary Christians call ourselves Trinitarians. That is to say, we believe in a God who is three. There's one God, but he's three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We didn't know that from the beginning. We began our Christian journey, as all good Jews did, by affirming the God who is one. He's God, or she's God, or it's God, but whatever it is, it's God. There is no diversity in God, right? God is the creator. God is the one who set his people free from, the, from Egypt in the Exodus. God is singular. And as the, the Jewish great prayer, the Shema holds, and this is a prayer Jews say every day, tonight is the first day of Hanukkah, by the way, they want to keep the Jewish people in prayer. Um, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad The Lord alone is God. The Lord is one. God is one. But then along comes this Jesus person. And we experience him, at least those who first encountered him, and we do today as well, to be the living, breathing incarnation of none less than God himself. We didn't know that before. So now, God is two. God has a son. And then after Jesus rises from the dead and ascends into heaven, we experience on Pentecost the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we also experience as nothing less than Almighty God. And now God is three. We hope it stops there. <laughs> what what could that possibly mean to say that there's one God, but we have encountered him in three different epiphanies? 
manifestations. Wars were fought about this, at least wars of words, in the first centuries of the Christian church. How can God be one, and how can God be three, and how can those both be true? And various solutions to that problem were proposed, most of them rejected. Um, some said, well, God is a, it's kind of a chain of command. First we have God the Father, who created everything. And then we have Jesus the Son, who's his offspring. And then we have the Holy Spirit, who's the offspring of Jesus, or maybe Jesus and God the Father, we don't know. Um, that's wrong. And again, this is where it's hard to get our minds around this. God is the only being of whom it can be seen. The problem is when we use words like person for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, Anne is a person, and I'm a person. We're two persons, but we're not the same. In fact, we are physically distinct. We are, we are radically different beings. That's not it with God. God's persons are the very thing that constitutes God as God in and of one's self. See the point? It's, it's utter mystery, and I don't mean to use that word as a throwaway excuse. Capital M mystery when it comes to the things of God means that we're trying to describe something that is literally indescribable in literal terms. Which is why this, this subtitle tonight, uh, Where is Jesus in the Old Testament, is already limiting it. Where is Jesus? Well, it depends whom you're talking about. If you're talking about baby Jesus who grew up to be the Nazarene, he's nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. If you're talking about the second person of the Holy Trinity, He's all over the Old Testament. And the way that Christians have tried to come to terms with that is to kind of retroject understandings of what seem to be intimations of Jesus in the Old Testament in light of what we have come to know through his life witness in the New Testament. Um, there are different ways of doing that. Um, let me stop here and I'd just like to call out and ask for a, a hollering out of a one or three word response to this question. Um, who is Jesus? There are 120 right answers to this question. <laughs> who is Jesus? Son of God. Son of God. Savior. Savior. He is God. He is God. Light of the world. Light of the world. Messiah. Messiah. All of those are right answers. But they come, some of them come from um, different ways of coming at the question. And I'm going to be, sorry, using some uh, Theo speak tonight. Um, in, in, theology, in the theology of God, there's a common distinction that is invoked between those who begin their discussion or their imaginations, quote, from above. That is to say, in thinking of Jesus, they begin with thinking about God who is three persons, and who dwells. Again, all of this is literally wrong. God is not up there, but we think of him as that way. And then, who subsequently descends in the person of the incarnate word, Jesus. It's called a theology or a Christology from above, because we start our thinking with God, and then this God, so to speak, comes down and becomes flesh in Jesus. So when you hear vocabulary like the word became flesh, that's from above. That's starting with a consideration of God in the Gospel of John. And Jesus comes down. The, the challenge in that is that it's really hard to understand how a guy like that can be really human when he's, when he's been existing from all time in the very nature of God. How is that like us? The alternative, and I mean, there are, there are dozens and dozens of titles for Jesus in the Gospels. Uh, Shepherd of Souls, uh, the Gatekeeper, uh, the Bread of Life, you can go on and on. But those are taken from Jesus' life ministry. The, the history of his earthly unfolded. That's what's called theology or Christology from below. 
we begin by considering the Jesus who walked around on earth, and of which we can read in the Gospels, and then we acknowledge that at some point he was reunited with his God, the very bosom of the Father. That's from below. We begin with the story of the man. That's what St. Matthew's doing. Jesus' life began in Bethlehem and then was subsequently subsumed into the life of God. The danger of that is it's really hard to understand how a guy like that can really be God. It's the equal and opposite danger. How can you account for the fact that this little baby in the manger is God? So, depending on where you begin the story, you're talking about two really different kinds of conversations. And the reason I'm mentioning all this, even though I haven't really delved into the Old Testament yet, is that if you're starting from below, from the man on earth, it's pretty easy to say, well, Jesus wasn't anywhere in the Old Testament. He was merely foretold, or he was anticipated, or he existed as a, a kind of a type in different events or people. And I'll point out something else. Um, if you start from above, then Jesus is presumed to be present in every aspect of the Old Testament. And it's difficult to see why this particular instantiation in the, in the Gospel of Matthew much matters. You know, it's very interesting. Um, for those of you who study Bible, and I know many of you have, um, chronologically, to notice the order in which the Gospels treat the importance of Jesus' earthly, and particularly early earthly life. Just by coincidence, last weekend, Sunday, we had as our Gospel on Sunday the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is the very earliest of the Gospels written probably about the year 70. And do you notice where the story of Jesus begins? First of all, it says the beginning of, and I, if you were paying attention to the homily, <laughs> uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Then it goes back to Isaiah. And then it flash forwards to John the Baptist. But the very first time that the actual story of Jesus' life is interesting to the writer of the Gospel of Mark is when he's an adult. He's already being baptized in the Jordan River. Mark doesn't care what came before that. You won't find any birth story in the Gospel of Mark. And then as a couple of decades roll on and the next couple of Gospels roll out, namely Matthew and Luke, there's this reflection that's saying we have recognized this man as substantially God. And if that's true when he's an adult, then he must have been God when he was born. And so let's reflect on that. And so if you go to either Matthew or Luke, both written in the year 80, 85, you will find very different, but Infancy, they're called infancy narratives, is the jargon. Stories of the birth of Jesus. And you will find miraculous things happening with stars and magi and uh, all kinds of miraculous happenings at the manger. Um, somehow that's, that's now become important. If he was divine from his birth, excuse me, as an adult, then he was divine in his birth. And that needs to be appropriately accounted for in the gospel. And then by the time we get to the Gospel of John, the one I just read for you, which is another 20, 30 years later, well, if he was divine at his birth, you don't become divine. He must have always been divine from all eternity. And so we begin, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is how it gets really messy. Um, one of the earliest heresies in the church, and in fact the heresy that precipitated the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, was the heresy called Arianism. Um, I won't go into large detail, and it's boring anyway, but it has great import for us because it called the question, did the second person of the Trinity always exist? whom we, in light of the 
incarnation called Jesus? Did he always exist? Arius, who was the namesake of the heresy, said no. If there's only one God, then there's only one principle of creation. I mean, otherwise you're, you're talking about an absurdity. What, what is a multiple of gods? If there's only one God, then God, God in himself, had to be the source of the origin of the second person of the Trinity, the one whom we now call Jesus. And in his famous phrase, he said, there was a time when the second person of the Trinity was not. It might have been a millisecond, but it had to be a time when God created the second person of the Trinity. And that was fought out for years in the fourth century and finally clarified in that council. And the bishops of the council rejected that. If Jesus, that is to say the second person of the Trinity, was created by God, he's not God. And if he's not God, then he didn't save anybody. Because only God can save somebody. And this is why, and some of this language seems dry as dust when we read it every Sunday in church, the Nicene Creed, after the homily. This is what, this is exactly why that language is so specific. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. That's precisely what was in dispute at that council. And why the council went way out of its way to say, we're going to say it three times. <laughs> the second person of the Trinity is God. To say anything else empties Jesus of his importance. And then, of course, there's the whole matter of the Holy Spirit, which wasn't even taken up at that council. And it's interesting, if you, if you pay close attention again to the language uh, of the Nicene Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. There's none of this definitive statement about, you know, God from God, light from light. Um, and in fact, if you if you go to the original version of the Nicene Creed, what we read in church is actually the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, <laughs> um, which was amended for purposes of the Holy Spirit about 50 years after the original. But at the original, the Holy Spirit wasn't in dispute in the original, in 325. So it says, all this language about Jesus, God from God, light from light, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a sentence, and in the Holy Spirit, period. That's all it says. Because nobody was disputing anything about the Holy Spirit at the time, and nobody quite knew what to say about it. Um, but the, the equal and alternative mistake about getting that right is what the early church fathers called subordinationism. Um, there's God the Father, and there's God the Son, that's kind of a second level, and there's God the Holy Spirit, kind of a third level. And I would submit that there's an awful lot of Christians and an awful lot of Catholics who think today that that's exactly how it is. You cannot say that. That is a formal heresy to deny the full godhood of any of the three persons. And that was again hashed out early and often in the first centuries of the church. But as I've often said, and many have said, the old heresies just keep coming back. Um, once you deny the full divinity of, of Christ or the Holy Spirit, you have warped God. We are Trinitarians, we are not Unitarians. Unitarians, and I would count Jews among Unitarians, what little I know of Judaism, believe in a God who is one. God is one. But that oneness consists of threeness. And again, just to bore you with needless trivia theology, um, it has sometimes been suggested that there is an essence of the one God in whom the three persons all partake, each in his or her own way. That's wrong too. There is no essence of God that is prior to threeness. Does that make sense? It blows your mind, but, but that's the fact. That you cannot get behind the three in order to postulate that, that stuff that is supposedly the, the unifying essence of God. All of this is, as 
believe it or not, it's an introduction. <laughs> in, doing, in doing some research on this, and this is where I learned to rule my decision to uh, pick this topic. Um, where was Jesus in the Old Testament? Well, I hope you can see by now the need to distinguish Jesus from second person of the Holy Trinity. But they're the same person. That's an article of faith. Jesus is the second divine person of the Holy Trinity in incarnate form. Is there more to the second divine person of the Holy Trinity than Jesus? Could be. That's a subject of great, great dispute on contemporary theology. Is it possible, for example, that there could have been more than one incarnation? Or that there could be again someday? Why not? The incarnation of Jesus, as, as we've come to know, discloses the fact that it's in God's very nature to throw himself off, I'm, I'm just going to use masculine pronouns for simplicity, I hope you don't mind, to throw himself off in self-giving love. That's, that's who God is. So why would we think that he would be confining himself to exactly one incarnation in Jesus? I'm not suggesting otherwise, by the way. Oh, don't quote me. Um, it's an article of faith that there was, in fact, exactly one incarnation, that being Jesus of Nazareth. But logically speaking, based on what that discloses about God, that not only doesn't preclude another possibility, but it might even suggest that. And this is where sometimes that discussion comes in, involved with uh, interreligious dialogue. You know, maybe the Buddha was another incarnation. I don't believe that, but because we're talking across such different boundaries and concepts. But, but theoretically, one could make a case for that on appeal to Christianity's own claims. So if I can actually address the topic today. Where was Jesus in the Old Testament? Um, strictly speaking, nowhere. Historical Jesus was not in the Old Testament. Where was the second person of the Trinity? or what we call the Son of God. Potentially, uh, and scholars are many minds about this, potentially in any number of places, in different ways. It's interesting, I read one article in preparation for tonight that was from a scholar from a Protestant seminary, who said, you know, think of the fact of the walk of Jesus on Resurrection Day on the road to Emmaus. The, the disciples are walking alongside him all day and they don't recognize him. And then suddenly they break bread and the blinds fall off and they recognize him. And do you remember the first thing Jesus said to them? Well, first he vanished from their sight. But, um, why were you so slow to believe all the things that were taught about me in the prophets, in the, in the scriptures? Which would mean the Old Testament. Which, if true, would mean Jesus himself expected a diligent, searching disciple to read the Old Testament scriptures and to come to some sort of intimation of his presence there. Enough so that he can reprimand them when they fail to do that. So it's not just we're, we're speculating that maybe there's something there. Jesus himself said there is something there. What is that something? I would suggest there are at least a couple of different kinds of somethings there. Um, in the Old Testament, um, many of them being in Genesis. There is a lot of discussion about appearances in Genesis and elsewhere of the so-called angel of the Lord appearing to various Old Testament characters. It's helpful for us to know that, or even God himself appearing to Old Testament characters, it's helpful for us to know that an angel does not describe a kind of uh, physiology, or lack thereof. An angel describes a function, a mission, an office, so that whenever you hear of angels of the Lord doing things in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, it's God doing something. And whether or not that's through a, a winged creature, which technically doesn't have a body, um, who knows, and it doesn't matter. It's God doing something. 
and God making a physical appearance of some kind to the people who apprehend it as such. Let me give you a couple of examples, and these will be familiar to you right now. Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred to your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you and make your name, I will, excuse me, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. So Abram went with the Lord and told him, and Lot went with him. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they arrived, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Who is that Lord that appeared to Abram? It doesn't say he had a vision. It doesn't say he had a dream. It says the Lord appeared to Abram. Could that be a, a momentary incarnation? It's not an incarnation. A momentary presentation of the very presence of God in physical form to Abram and his tribe. Could that be we would say in retrospect, Jesus? Nobody's claiming that he's a human, whoever this Lord is. That comes much later. But could that be Jesus? Could there have been real appearances of the second divine person in Old Testament history? We hold it as a question. Yet again, um, Genesis 17 when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. The Lord appeared to Abram. How? What was that? And said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you. Two chapters later. Chapter 19, verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he saw them. He rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go on your way. What was that? The Almighty God is not corporeal, that is to say bodily, in and of himself at least not in a human way, at least not until Jesus. So what was it, or who was it, that these people saw? Genesis 22, beginning at verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abram, Abram, Abram. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do any of the sacrifice of Isaac. Or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven, and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this, and not withheld your son from me, I will indeed bless you. Certainly God. Is it just a voice? Or is there a presence? Again, this is open to legitimate scriptural and theological debate. But there's no reason to preclude out of hand the fact that God could not have made physical appearances to these Old Testament patriarchs. Or we can go to Exodus. This will be also familiar to you. Moses was, keep, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, 
for he was afraid to look at God. There was something there to be seen, not an incarnation. And by incarnation, I mean the full wedding of a human with the divine. But there was something there to be seen. Uh, the theological jargon talks about that in terms of theophanies, actual physical manifestations of God in some sort of, of earthly form. And perhaps the last one of these I'll just offer as, a, as an example. Um, Judges, chapter 13. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. His wife was barren, having borne no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Although you are barren, having borne no children, you will conceive and bear a son. Now be careful not to drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean. For you, shall con you will conceive and bear a son. No razor is to come on his head, for the boy will be a Nazareth to God from birth. And it is he who shall deliver Israel. Um, this is the story of the birth of Samson. There's somebody there talking to Manoah. Who is that somebody? It's clearly God. Is it God the Father? Is it God the Holy Spirit? It's not, again, strictly speaking, Jesus. So these are just kind of a, a hodgepodge of ways in which we can think of the very possibility that the second person of the Holy Trinity could have taken some sort of physical form, even in the Old Testament, prior to Jesus, and been in some sort of discourse with the great heroes of, of salvation history. There's nothing to preclude that. We name him Jesus in the New Testament, but he was there same person, the same divine person prior to that. He is also present in the Old Testament, this Jesus or so we say, in the form of predictions. The predictions of the oracles of the is that a hand up? Yeah. Okay. I just I think of the three visitors to Abraham. And I've got the icon, the Russian icon of the Trinity, the three visitors to Abraham, and that would be where we'd see all some people would say all three of the persons of the Trinity coming to visit Abraham in the Old yep. Testament. Yep. And, and it's interesting because probably Abraham didn't have any information of that at the time. But looking back on it, we who are Trinitarians would say, hmm, that's interesting. Um, it's interesting too if we go back all the way to the creation of the world. If you, you know there are two creation stories in the book of Genesis. Um, I can't remember which one uh, involves this. But God refers to God's own self in the plural. It pleases us that we have made this creation. But why is God a plural? In the very first pages of the Old Testament, that would be contrary to any natural inclination toward monotheism, the belief in one God. So, again, we, we look back at this from post-Christian point of view, when we say, oh, well, yeah, God was always talking about himself as a plural. But that's that's not perhaps what was going on then. And this goes to a, a lot of the points of what I want to make in terms of uh, the prediction uh, types of things. Um, particularly the Gospel of Matthew, but not only in Matthew, is very, very concerned to see how, you see, Jesus is fulfilling all of these things that were said about him from long, long ago, and you didn't get it, but now you get it. The most famous one, of course, uh, among many, is from the prophet Isaiah, of whom we are hearing much during this season. Uh, we listen carefully. This is Isaiah chapter 7. This is the story when King Ahaz is trying to make uh, military alliances with his enemies in order to keep Israel from being destroyed. And God is saying, you don't have to do that. I will take care of you. I will protect you. Don't make military alliances with Egypt and Syria, those other places. And this is what it says. This is God speaking. For the head of Aram is Damascus. The head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered and no longer a people. 
And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is the son of Ramaliah. If you do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. This is the most implicit response of, of, of all, of course. Ahaz doesn't want to ask because he doesn't want to get the wrong answer. <laughs> then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look at the young woman. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. For he shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. St. Matthew, of course, is very well aware of this verse, and deliberately goes all the way back there in his gospel and says, look what Isaiah said all these hundreds of years ago. The virgin will be with child and bear a son. Did you hear something funny in what I just said? Isaiah doesn't talk about a virgin. He talks about a young woman. Uh, the point being here, it's really easy to go back and kind of proof text, especially when you're tweaking the language. Um, the fact is that these Old Testament texts, even though we are not wrong to see prefigurements of Jesus in them, have their own integrity. Um, that is to say, they meant something for the people who actually spoke them and the people who actually heard them 500 odd years before Jesus. There would have been a young woman in Isaiah's purview whom Isaiah could have noticed was bearing a son and would have been a sign of something promising about God. That doesn't negate anything about Matthew's use of this prefigurement or this prediction, but it does say the Old Testament doesn't simply exist in order to validate the new. The Old Testament has its own integrity. And of course for Jews, the Old Testament remains the scriptures. And they, they, they don't need to be apologetic for a, a, a Christian reinterpretation of them, even if sometimes that was, that's what we're inclined to do. Um, another great kind of classic prediction um, text from Isaiah uh, is the text, there are several of them, of the so-called suffering servant from the later chapters of Isaiah. Um, and this, we hear this is very often at the Passion Time, at the Lent of Easter. See, my servant shall prosper. This is Isaiah 52. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see. And that which they have not heard, they shall contemplate. It's easy as a Christian to go back to that text and say, oh, he's talking about the crucifixion and the passion. The fact is that there was some sort of, or very probably was some sort of suffering servant in Isaiah's own time and place, to whom he was making reference. And our own Christian appropriation of that verse doesn't, doesn't make that void, but it does say um, that has its own integrity too. Um, perhaps one of the, the most important ones here, Luke, uh, we're now in the New Testament, Luke chapter uh, 24 beginning in verse 25. Again, this is the Jesus person at, at, uh, uh, what time did they go to? Emmaus, thank you. Um, then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things, and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the things about himself in the scriptures. That would be the Jewish scriptures. So, perhaps, uh, and I don't want to go on too long without a break here, um, very much of what we choose to understand about, 
about where and how to find Jesus, both in the Old and the New Testament, uh, is the result of what we think we're looking for. Um, people of biblical times, New Testament times, knew they were looking for a suffering servant. And they knew they were looking for someone who had come directly from God. Um, one of the great insights into how we recognize Jesus is to recognize what it is we think we're looking for. And one of the great ways to do that in heaven is to appeal to the so-called old antiphons. Is that a familiar term yeah. to some of you? Um, the old antiphons are those antiphons that the church um, sings and chants during the final week of Advent, just before Christmas. Um, you know them most familiarly uh, from the, the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, O come. Um, because they all begin this prayer with O. Um, this, is a, this is a prayer chant that goes back perhaps to the 4th century of the church. We know it goes back at least to the 6th because it's been commented upon. Um, and you, don't, you all know it from the song. But I think we would, we would do well to know what it is that the people of ancient times thought they were looking for so that they would recognize Jesus when he appeared as the fulfillment of all things. So I'm just going to read the, the seven of them. They begin officially on December 7th. And, and there's all kinds of Old Testament resonances here. O wisdom of our God most high, guiding creation with power and love, come to teach us the path of knowledge. That's the first O antiphon. We are searching for a wisdom figure. Someone who bears God's wisdom. And I haven't even spoken about that yet. Um, I was wandering all over this Bible today, this morning, because that came up in a conversation. What about the wisdom tradition? Um, this is an ecumenical study Bible, which means the book of wisdom isn't in it. That's a Catholic thing. Um, but there's a whole other tradition in the Old Testament having to do with naming the, the offspring of God as wisdom. And you know this from many of the wisdom books, the Proverbs and the Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Job and uh, with the Book of Wisdom itself, in which wisdom is personified. It's not, it's not given a, a, a body, a physical description, but the, the scripture texts talk about wisdom as something almost distinct from God, but of God. And that's a strong tradition that's carried forward into many of the uh, texts of the New Testament. Jesus is the bearer of God's wisdom. The second O antiphon. O leader of the house of Israel, giver of the law to Moses on Sinai, come to rescue us with your mighty power. God is the teacher. Jesus is the teacher, the one who will teach us how to behave, how to know God's will for our lives. That's the one for whom we long. O root of Jesse's stem, sign of God's love for all his people, come to save us without delay. Root of Jesse's stem. Jesse, of course, is the father of King David. So we're looking for a savior who's somehow aligned with that royal Davidic line. O key of David, opening the gates of God's eternal kingdom, come and free the prisoners of darkness. Somehow we recognize that we are in a position of peril here, or for danger, unable to save ourselves. The one for whom we look is the one who comes as the one to unlock the jail cell, if you will. O radiant dawn, splendor of eternal light, son of justice, Come and shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death. The one for whom we look is the one who will give us light, who will give us freedom, who will give us peace. O King of all nations, the keystone of the church, come and save us whom you formed from the dust. The one whom, for whom we look is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. And finally, O Emmanuel, our King and Giver of Law, come to save us 
Lord our God. Emmanuel, God is with us. The person for whom we look is the one who will bring God, God's own being, to be one with us forever. I want to just say one more thing, um, and then we can break it, we can have a discussion as you wish. Um, last week, uh, of course, we celebrated in the church the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Um, a very confusing feast for many of us, including me. Um, but the importance of that feast is that what was truly different about Jesus after his birth, his conception really, uh, as opposed to before, is that now God was not only communicating with human beings, perhaps appearing to them, perhaps teasing us with little hints of what was to come, but now God is one with us. And the importance of the Immaculate Conception and of, of Mary's life generally is that without her, yes, that could not have happened. Jesus, in order to save us humans, had to be human. There's an old adage in Catholic theology, that which is not assumed, meaning human nature, cannot be saved. I used the example this morning, I am incapable of saving a cat because I'm not a cat. Jesus would be incapable of saving truly humans were he simply some alien, alien life form. But Jesus took on everything of what it means to be human, and it was only in virtue of Mary's yes for willingness to do that 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 was possible. So it's a, it's a high, high honor uh, that we rightfully hold to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, we came up this morning, we, we sometimes get carried away in throwing honorary titles on Mary, um, including the title of co-redemptrix, which can have the effect of sounding like, well, there's two saviors, or it's Jesus and Mary, the superhero team. Um, those two are not the same. We have one redemptor, but one redeemer, that's Jesus. The point being, Jesus was only put in a position to be able to do that because of a yes from Mary. That is no small thing. The, the future of human salvation depended upon that. So let's take a break, have some uh, things to eat and drink, and uh, we'll come back in six or seven minutes. And um, we can stay as early or as late as you want and just have a conversation. A great opportunity just to have a little conversation over anything that may have come up while I was talking. Um, I was just having a little conversation during the break. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the absolute importance of maintaining that this Jesus who was born in Bethlehem and this second person of the Trinity who was, as they say, born before all time, uh, are the same person, which creates all kinds of really difficult imaginative problems for how that can be. Um, specifically, there are all kinds of aspects. We say Jesus is human. 100% human, and he's divine, 100% divine. There are all kinds of predications that we make about those two kinds of beings that seem almost completely at odds. To be human is to live specifically at a moment in time, in a culture, in a family, with certain limitations on knowledge, including perhaps knowledge of God. To be divine, is to be, is to have access to all of that, to be precisely unconstricted by time and space and knowledge and uh, not subject to the powers of the world. We continue to make these very tensive claims about this same person, and it's not always easy. And the, the early church was not was not slow to recognize this. Um, so we. Our traditional default has been to sort of attribute things. We attribute all knowledge to the second divine person of the Trinity. We attribute specificity to the incarnate son of Bethlehem. Um, it doesn't really solve the problem, but it allows us to get away with saying apparently contradictory things about the same person. Hmm. Bill? Wasn't one of the issues uh, with the Eastern Orthodox Church in the sense of um, Christ's humanity versus divinity and, and 
understanding of it, wasn't that one of the schisms or the conflicts that we have with the Eastern Orthodox Church or what have I'm not personally aware of that. Um, what, what I have learned through studying Trinity and teaching Trinity courses, one of the big divergences is uh, most of the Eastern churches in their consideration of God begin with a consideration of three. In the West, we tend to begin with a consideration of one. Um, and again, we have equal and opposite problems. If you start with three, then how are those one? If you start with one, then how are those three? We're inheritors of the tradition of St. Augustine, for better or worse, um, and I would argue plenty of both, um, influenced the Western theological tradition fundamentally, and still does. Uh, is that connected to, you said Unitarian? I mean, not connected, but Unitarian, I don't know what that means. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, well, to, for anyone who's a Unitarian, the and there is such a thing as a Unitarian Church. Um, the, the conception of God is that God is strictly one, which for any monotheistic religion, including ours, that makes sense. There's only one God. But what Unitarians will not concede is that within that union, that within that one, there is three. Um, it's just one. And why that, why that matters, at least to me, um, and I think I hope for everybody, is that if you're a Unitarian, then God simply is there as a life force. And if you've been to Unitarian churches, and I've been rarely, but I have, that tends to be the way they describe God. God is the cosmic life force. But God is not an animated kind of communion. Um, I, I think that could be argued that they're not Christian. Um, but for, for a Trinitarian, God is necessarily in motion all the time, even within God's own self. So that it's not possible to think of a God who's just there as a life force. God is constantly self-giving and receptive of, of the other person's self-giving and moving out of God's self into creation as, as self-giving. Not that he has to, but he does. But there is not considered Christian? No. I, I think it could be our church. Well, I've heard that it's not Christian and that they're, they're more like Jews rather than the Christians. That would make sense to me because if you're not going to acknowledge Jesus Christ as fully divine, um, which it sounds like a Unitarian would not, that would make that would certainly make you something other than Christian. It, That's what I said. Yeah. And of course, how people define themselves is different from how we might define from, from our own perspective. Mormons think they're Christians. I don't think they're Christians. I don't know that it matters who's right about that, but we don't believe the same things. Yeah. Mike, how much of a stumbling block is this whole concept of Trinity? Does somebody who never had that background to give it and then want to convert to a religion that has it, is that a real stumbling block for them to accept and I don't know the answer to that, but the question is, how big is a stumbling block this Trinity thing? Um, to me, it makes perfect sense. Um, if one has had a, a meaningful encounter with Jesus Christ and or the Holy Spirit, and become convinced that this is truly God with whom we are having to deal here, um, that just makes sense. There, there has to be more to God than just the, the life force that created things at the beginning and keeps them in, in being. Of course, not everybody has that encounter with Christ and the Spirit. Okay, sitting there, still at the beginning of your talk, um, thinking about God and the triune type of idea and. When I think about water, how it can water, and it can be in vapor, and even solids, and whatever, it's still fundamentally water, like the way we sense it differently. And so I think about, and it's my own way of conceptualizing this, but I think about Jesus as being, <coughs> you know, we can't 
found God in the all over. We're not built to have a sensory life, but we do have eyes and hands and can feel. Um, so in my mind, I think maybe that is the re- part of the reason why when we're talking about the word becoming flesh, it's because we're built not to be able to sense the all. Exactly. Or God fully. Yep. Okay. I'd say that's excellent. And sometimes it's just struggling. Well, I, I think that uh, that water metaphor is great because water can be solid, liquid, or vapor, mm-hmm. and it's still the same. The same like thing. Yeah. It's experienced differently depending on the, the circumstances. Water is the symbol. And water is the symbol for God. That's a very biblical symbol. But all of, all of our languages. Um, and that's it's our, our weak attempts at metaphors and analogies. Um, God is not water in the most literal sense, but God is water. Um, we can experience God as water. But, but all of our attempts to, to nail down literally God equals this is wrong. The minute I say God is Father, I've said something that's literally not true. Because God is not like a father in any way that we experience fatherhood in this world. But he is a father. And he is a son. And he is a Holy Spirit. And he is a she. I think all of scripture is, is you know, it, it's writings about somewhat historical things, but they're also things that bring us deeper into the mystery of God. New Testament or Old Testament, and you know, obviously you pointed out that the Old Testament—I mean, the New Testament writers already had this sense that Jesus was revealed in some way, experienced in some way in the Old Testament. And I know for myself personally that when I found out about that and started to read the Old Testament in sort of that eyes, it came alive and drew me into a, a deeper sense of mystery about God and that second person. And I think somewhat we've lost that a bit in the church, that sense of mystery and being able to to look with those eyes and see deeper beyond just the words on the page. I agree with you. We we tend to have a high desire for clarity, conceptual clarity in in theology. I was talking at the break with, with Judy done a lot of theological study, you know, <coughs> ambiguity is not a bad thing, but it drives some people crazy, <laughs> like engineers. I say that only because I, I taught a lot of engineer type seminarians. And they want conceptual clarity. They don't want ambiguity. You cannot talk about God with conceptual clarity. You just can't. And if you try to, you are distorting the, the art. We're in a like that as a people. Mm-hmm. Because we want our thinking, we want everybody else to kind of fit into our thinking. Or we don't think we're wrong. But, but in, in Thing of, it's the thing of God is that, I don't know, if he's going to be our friend, we almost have to be human. If, if we want something done, so if he isn't going to go, maybe we'll go to the Father. So if we want all the guys in the little compartment and, and all our friends and all our relatives and all their little, and they shouldn't be crossing the line because, right. yeah. And, then, and that's a, another historical temptation we've fallen into is God the Father is the God who's got the creation job. Yeah. And God the Son is the one who's got the redeeming job. And yeah. God the Holy Spirit is the one who does the inspiration job. Um, as if God could be divided into into yeah. functions. Yeah. And that's wrong. And they can't be all. They can't be more than one thing. Just some of them. But any one of the persons is fully God. That's right. <laughs> well, Father, I've struggled with the fact that the Old Testament doesn't, the New 
Testament doesn't counteract the, uh, they gave the Old Testament the compliments that there isn't a contradiction. You would think there logically might be, because obviously Christ's coming would create a different paradigm and that sort of thing, but that didn't happen. I, I just I just think that's amazing when what when you talk about it and read read it, it's foretelling the truth of what happened. So and, and there are many along the way who have tried to posit that the New Testament basically wipes out the old. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Those have been condemned, but, but that was a early another early heresy of the church. Um, they they go they require one another. Which adds a new uh, legitimacy to the old testament the beliefs of the Jewish and, and I should point out, I, I mentioned a couple of examples from the Gospel of Matthew tonight. Um, it's not incidental that Matthew is very, very much concerned to emphasize that continuity because Matthew's writing for a Jewish audience. Mm -hmm. And for Jews, it's very important that this Messiah fulfill the promises of the Old Testament. They, they would care about that. Uh, in a way in which other audiences of other Gospels, specifically Luke, maybe Mark, um, wouldn't wouldn't be so interested. They'd be interested in Jesus for other reasons, but not because he was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Okay. Well, what's the line Jesus said then? I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Didn't he? Wasn't that part of scripture? Yep. So I just been help with that. I have to know where that, which which gospel that came from. I, I well, thought it's Matthew. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> okay. And, and it, it's dangerous to put one quote on anything because yeah. um, okay. you can find whatever you want in scripture. But uh, yeah. well, there was a big fight too about circumcision versus uh, baptism, the entrance into. The Jewish religion and into the Christian religion. Yep. Is the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Um, that, you know, that, that came up this morning as well. Um, there is certainly a spirit in the Old Testament, probably not understood in the way that we understand the third person of the Trinity. God created the world with breath. So there's there's this constant emphasis of God breathing um, and that God's breath is created. That's, this also came up this morning. Um, our history of thinking about God has been so telescoped on Jesus that the Holy Spirit has sort of been left as the, the orphan child, um, which is really wrong. And unfortunate because the Holy Spirit has its own integrity um, in terms of accomplishing the work of salvation that, that is not other than Jesus but that is unique to the Holy Spirit. We, uh, are, you, are you familiar with the uh, filioque controversy? I don't need to get all jargony on you. Um, this came up again this morning. Um, whose Holy Spirit is it? Um, this has a, a famous long history of war. The Council of Nicaea, um, again, as I said earlier, because it wasn't really interested in debating the Holy Spirit, it didn't say much about it. But in producing the Nicene Creed, it said, of the Holy Spirit, it proceeds from the Father, which is not what we say now. We say it proceeds from the Father and the Son. That and the Son, which is called the filioque, that, that's the Latin for and the Son, that was unilaterally added by the Western Church a couple hundred years later. The, the Eastern Church doesn't say that. But the, the reason it was added was that, as I said earlier, there's no logical reason why God couldn't have two sons. And the, by adding... He proceeds from the Father and the Son and makes the Holy Spirit really something other than the Son. But the danger of that is it's the, the Spirit of the Son. And it's not the Spirit of the Son. It's fully God. 
Can you imagine spending your career teaching this? <laughs> <laughs> so we see the depiction of uh, God in the Sistine Chapel and other places physically presented, uh, which was probably from early tradition and for those who didn't read and the depiction of the faith. But that gave you the impression you related to it and you talk about it. This God didn't appear physically to man. Mm -hmm. But he was portrayed in different times we see in cultural and historic things. Uh, which is really not true. Well, we don't know that that's not true, but it doesn't have so there are questions you have that could be that God appears. Mm -hmm. Why not? God can do whatever God wants. <laughs> Which, and I didn't get into it, and thank you for not doing it either, but um, <laughs> this whole question of angels, when we start talking about the, the mission of angels, and what is that? Um, I, I, I can't speak intelligently about that, so, which is why I'm glad we're not going there. But it, it does raise the whole question, you know, who are these people? They're not people, they're disembodied creatures. Um, what is an angel, and how is it different from God? because they seem to be used interchangeably, angels of God. That will be another talk. <laughs> I just trying to... I mean, all these passages from the Old Testament that we see as prefiguring Jesus, obviously the Jewish people do not. And is that because Jesus was not the Messiah that they expected? Or is it because of their belief that God is one? Or is it some perhaps both? Well, the, the Jews await a Messiah. Um, and I, I cannot speak intelligently about how Jewish people would understand how that works vis a vis God. But. Um, the Jews would be convinced, as I mentioned earlier, that the Old Testament scriptures have their own integrity. The, the Christian scriptures, when they do this, tend to use the Old Testament as proof text. See, look, at they said it was going to happen, and now it happened, and we have to change a word here or there to make sure that it happened. That way. But Jews would say this, these scriptures have their own meaning for their own time and place. And, and as Again, this came up this morning. Um, the biggest, my understanding is, the biggest reason that Jewish people do not acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah is the, the way the world looks and has looked for the last 2,000 years. The Messiah is going to usher in a, a time of grace and peace and justice. If you open the morning paper, we ain't got any of that. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a legitimate pushback. Where's, where's the evidence of your Messiah? Next year in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The famous quotation. Yep. Yeah. So they make it up the rest of us. One last question and then I'll let you get out of here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your kind attention. I hope that there's been some meaningful uh, reflection here tonight. Please do. Uh, Fill out the blue sheets on your table. I don't know if you have anything else you want to say. Fill out the blue sheets. Let us know what you'd like to see. Great. Again, thank you for coming.